Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you all for joining this webinar, uh, hosted mm -hmm. by U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance and its international collective. USFSA is an alliance of food producers, labor, environmental groups, faith-based and anti-hunger, and food justice advocacy organizations. My name is Shaini Vergis, and I work with the Institute of for Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, a member of USFSA. Oh. A couple of logistics points before we, I hand over to Tristan from ActionAid, my co-moderator. You'll see that you are all muted now. I think uh, you might be muted by now. And when you want to speak later on, you can unmute, unmute yourself. Feel free to use the chat function to share your thoughts as you listen in because that's what will help us organize our thoughts later and the discussions later. If you have any clarification questions to specific to any particular speaker, then put that in the chat too. But if you can tag the person, that will be great. So now we have three amazing speakers with us. Patty Naylor, she farms with her husband, George, in West Central Iowa, growing non-GMO and organic corn and soybeans, oats, hay, cider, apples, and chickens. She's a board member of Wisconsin-based Family Farm Defenders, a member organization of National Family Farm Coalition and U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance. She also serves as the alternate focal point on the North American subregion of the Civil Society Mechanism of the Committee on World Food Security. You'll hear more about the CFS later. Jim Good Goodman is the board president of uh, National Family Farm Coalition. Jim and his wife, Rebecca, run 45 cow organic dairy and direct market beef farm in Southwest Wisconsin for 40 years. Currently, he serves as a board member of Midwest Environment Advocates and Family Farm Defenders. Then we have Pat Mooney, who has more than four decades of experience working in international civil society, first addressing the aid and, and development issues, and then focusing on food, agriculture, and commodity trade. In 1977, Monif co-founded Rafi, Rural Advancement Fund, Fund International, renamed ETC Group in 2001. He received the Right to Livelihood Award in the Swedish Parliament in 1985 and the Pearson Peace Prize from Canada, Canada's Governor General in 1998. ETC remains a nano-CSO with office in Canada, USA, Mexico, Philippines, and Ethiopia and works, close in, works in close cooperation with uh, many CSOs around the world. He's also on the board of IATP. Now with that, I will, uh, so these three presenters will have three minutes each. After those presentations, next five minutes will be for the clarifications and that will be directed to them. I think that will leave us about 45 minutes for an open discussion. With that, I'll hand it over to Tristan from ActionAid to introduce us uh, in, to give a short background of the webinar and then take it from there. Welcome, uh, Tristan. Thank you very much, Shiny, and uh, welcome everybody to the to this webinar of the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance um, International Relations Collective. So, just wanted to set the stage for the conversation and the presentations we're going to have uh, today. So, I think. Um, Everybody knows that the corona, coronavirus pandemic has made the problems of the corporate food system readily apparent. Things like climate change, uh, prevalence of diet-related disease, and farm crises uh, were already raising concerns, but now the pandemic is exposing just how much the system relies on exploiting workers and how it's designed to produce profit and not food. So as we enter potentially a new food crisis and communities and movements increase demands for food sovereignty and agroecology, we also will need to increase coordination with allies around the world. For decades, rural social movements have coordinated globally through, among other bodies, the IPC, the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, an inclusive coordinating body composed of people's movements from many different rural constituencies and regions. Dating back to the late 90s, uh, social movements recognized that the rise of the World Trade Organization, the WTO, as a global coordination space for business and corporations was a serious threat to the national struggle for, or to national struggles for food sovereignty. Through the IPC and other uh, 
uh, bodies, global social movements work to open strategic space within the UN system, the United Nations system, because it was one of the main global spaces open to social movements to coordinate and push back against global agribusiness, strengthening national struggles in the process. There have been important advances within the UN. Uh, such as the recent Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and long-time work around the human right to food. Two specific ad advances relevant to our conversation today are the UN Seed Treaty signed in 2001, which introduced the idea of farmers' rights and forced uh, agribusiness and seed companies to pay farmers for using their seeds, which rural communities had developed over generations. The second is that following the 2007-2008 food price crisis, the IPC and its members and allies pushed for reform of the UN Committee on World Food Security, making it the most democratic space in the UN system, with social movements able to debate governments as equals and with an important independent coordinating body for civil society, the Civil Society Mechanism, or CSM, which also reflects the inclusivity of the IPC in all the different rural constituencies and, and regions. Um, because of that, those reforms, the CFS is now engaged in a multi-year process of policy recommendations for agroecology as the solution to food security in the face of climate change. However, many of these gains are under threat as agribusiness and the governments that are most closely aligned with them, such as uh, the US government, attempt to co-opt and dis my government, uh, the government uh, I'm, I'm with uh, living in the United States for folks that don't know, um, attempt to co-opt and discredit agroecology and take back these global policy spaces from social movements. They are doing this by pushing a technology driven approach. Corporations are trying to use new genetic technologies like CRISPR. I'm not going to try to spell out that acronym, um, but they're using it to undermine and dismantle the farmers' rights uh, that are included in the UN Seed Treaty at the CFS, the Committee on World Food Security. The US government in particular is trying to weaken and depoliticize agroecology by reducing it to just a set of techniques. Additionally, recently the US ambassador to the UN in Rome, where all these agencies, these UN agencies are based, recently made uh, racist and imperialist attacks against agroecology as being anti-progress and against the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and its member countries as increasingly being counted to quote unquote American values. It's very troubling. Finally, the UN in a new partnership with the World Economic Forum which has emerged as a new global coordinating space for corporations and business is planning a World Food System Summit for 2021 in New York City, which threatens to take decision-making power um, for global food and agriculture policy away from the CFS in Rome, where social movements have power, and bring it to New York City, where corporations have much more power within the UN system. As US organizations, uh, we have a special responsibility to international allies to challenge and hold U.S. companies and the U.S. government accountable. But we must also contend with the fact that the U.S. government is very hostile to the U.N., works to limit U.S. civil society participation at the U.N., or at least discourage it, and undermines the legitimacy of the U.N. to the general public in this country. The U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance has been trying to stay involved in these processes for the last 10 years and have had representatives at various meetings, including uh, our presenters today. So we will hear from them why global coordination is important and how participating in these global spaces can make grassroots organizations stronger. Um, U.S. grassroots alliances and social movements have an important recent history of global coordination and protest stretching from the battle in Seattle in 1999 to uh, the 2014 UN Climate Summit where social movements led by uh, in particular the Climate Justice Alliance but also many others organized uh, were very active in the streets and organized a counter summit a people's climate justice summit that the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance was also at. With this new food system summit coming in 2021, there's potentially another opportunity to push back against agribusiness and build power. And I wanna just end by saying that with so many emergencies and uh, injustices that frontline communities in the food system are dealing with as a result uh, of this COVID-19 pandemic, the conversation we're having uh, about to have today may not seem like an urgent priority, but the food system was already making us sick before this pandemic, and we know that agribusiness will use this opportunity to expand uh, their control and grab power, both in the U.S. and around the world. We're going to need to coordinate globally and use every space available to push back and demand real change, to demand that things don't just go back 
to what we had before because that was not working either. We have to we have to demand something new. We need agroecology. We need food sovereignty. So I will end there, um, and I think I will hand it over to Patty Naylor to do her presentation. So thank you. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. It is um, um, an honor to be here today. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for the support that I've had um, as the um, sort of a um, in-training co uh, coordinating committee member, um, Nettie Weave of uh, the National, Family, National Farmers Union of Canada is the current um, coordinating committee member. Um, and in this position, I did go to Rome last October, um, representing National Family Farm Coalition, the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance, and also the Via Campesina in North America. I did find it to be quite a complex pandemic and the situation um, really does show the importance of the space of international spaces overall. Um, and I think the strength, of, um, so I'd like to go through some a few slides. Uh, first slide, I will show the, um, the structure of the Committee on, uh, the Committee on World Food Security. Um, this is an inclusive intergovernmental and international political platform. Um, the importance of this food security is um, one part of it, but as we all know, uh, we need to work through um, these kind of spaces to promote food sovereignty as well. Uh, next slide. This is the structure of the Committee on World Food uh, Security. It shows um, the Civil society at the top um, level as a private sector, which is towards the bottom of that right hand side. Um, unfortunately, uh, the private sector has more funding. Uh, what I learned last fall was that uh, the civil society mechanism um, does struggle with uh, people aren't always able to um, travel for in person meetings um, as they should be able to. And so the private sector really does have a lot of influence to have their own uh, a category there called uh, the World Farmers Organization, uh, which in would include industrial farmers, not the kind of farmers. Which includes uh, Canada and United States. Um, as you can see, the coordinating committee is on the right there and is involved in the um, advisory group. That's an impo very important space. Uh, Nettie Weeb is part of the advisory committee right now, the advisory group. Um, as you can see, also, there's the CSM policy working groups, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more in length uh, next. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this, the, the CSM, uh, the, the official title of it is Civil Society and Indigenous Peoples Mechanism. Um, the final three points on this, on this um, slide, I think it's an open and inclusive space. It does not have formal members, but participating organizations and all these organizations that were listed on the previous page. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the policy working group said, this is where most of the work gets done. It's the fundamental part of the CSM work. Uh, the political inputs to the CFS process are articulated here. Civil society has a common position to be brought to the CFS for open debates um, and participation by organizations. This is where um, if anybody, if our, our organizations want to get involved, this is the, the, the um, path to do that. Um, and each of these are working groups are coordinated by one or two members of the um, coordinating committee. Um, there are several policy working groups, and you can find these on the website of the CSM. Agroecology, food systems and nutrition, and global food governance are um, some of the main ones. Next slide. Um, so this is uh, uh, just a uh, photo of um, my experience in Rome, um, I was able as a family farmer to give the uh, CSM intervention 
on uh, the launch of the decade of uh, family farming. Um, after I spoke, um, our ambassador from the U.S. Um, named Kip Tom also spoke and um, emphasized, of course, uh, biotechnology and uh, uh, the importance of technology in, in agriculture. Uh, he himself considers himself a family farmer, but um, he is quite different than, um, than the farmers that I know in the sense that he is much larger. It is a um, incorporated, not that that makes much difference, but he has, he has um, farming operations in Indiana and also in Argentina. And part of what he does is to grow seed for seed companies such as Monsanto. Uh, he is heavily involved with um, technology in his own uh, farming operation and relies on that heavily without the technology that he uses such as um, genetically engineered crops and the herbicides and wouldn't be able to do what he does uh, and that is just he's just an example of um, the kind of agriculture and um, um, governments uh, such as the United States are promoting. Um, <clears throat> I also um, was able to uh, personally hand uh, the ambassador um, a letter from the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance uh, after we had a, um, a private meeting uh, with him, um, and he physically reacted to it in the sense that he um, he felt or he he seemed to pull back when we confronted him. It was a uh, quite a telling um, uh, inter interchange. I felt. Um, but important also. I also had a private conversation with him, short, short conversation um, <clears throat> one evening in which I expressed my concern about free trade agreements and his comment was, I believe in free trade. And I, I hope um, most of us know that free trade agreements and the WTO, the rules of the WTO destroy any country's ability to achieve food sovereignty. So those are important issues for us to understand. Um, I'm also, as a, farm, as a farmer uh, in these spaces, able to recognize the false narratives and the propaganda that Bagger Business and, and the supporting governments um, uh, revealed at the plenary and at the side events in Rome and in other spaces as well. Um, so I'm going to go on uh, and talk a little bit more about agroecology in, in this space. Um, the CFS uh, uh, um, um, had a report um, developed by the high level, um, high level, oh my, HL, HLPE report, uh, high level panel of experts, excuse me. And that was uh, completed in July of 2019. And after that, um, the voluntary guidelines that are um, put together for governments to follow on a voluntary basis, but still very important, have been put together in a zero draft. The idea was that these, guidelines would be collected and the finished product would be ready by later this year. However, because able to uh, engage and not able, able to uh, meet in person, which, uh, the CSM is, is strongly encouraging um, uh, the CFS to, to slow down this process so that we can meet in person. A lot of people in uh, around the world are not able to um, access uh, online um, um, platforms such as this, and they also are very much distracted by the current pandemic. So we're trying to get that slowed down. I think we're doing that. Um, in the meantime, we also have um, uh, comments have been written. Uh, Pesticide Action Network here in North America um, produced a, a very good um, comments on the, uh, the draft of the guidelines, the agroecology guidelines. And the CSM itself collectively um, presents uh, guide, um, comments as well. And those are available um, on the website of the CSM. Um, so this process needs to be followed. The strength of, one of the strengths of the CSF is its processes and its structure. And so we're really working to make sure that that stays in place. Uh, mm -hmm. One important aspect of the agroecology voluntary guidelines is that it's called agroecology and other innovations. That was other innovations is where the technology part um, seems to be able to be pushed in. Um, well, a couple of things I want to say um, to finish up about what we can do. Uh, we already have um, an agroecology um, 
letter in, in the process from the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance. Some of the people on this call are involved in that. I think it's important that we recognize that the push against agroecology comes from a mindset of capitalism and imperialism. Um, the ambassador Tom um, spoke uh, was a, gave a speech at agriculture agricultural outlook forum. I believe it was in February, and he uh, said that agroecology is defined very specifically to rule out the technologies that made the green deal green revolution possible. And he said there was a heavy overlay of anti-capitalism and anti-trade ideology. He said that as if that was bad, of course. Um, uh, but we have to recognize, I think, that agroecology is much more than practices. It's a holistic approach to an equitable and just food system. It is the pathway to food sovereignty. And I think the, the difference with agroecology is it includes a political analysis of what is wrong with the current agriculture system and how we can counter the remarks such as those of Ambassador Tom and others. Uh, we can work, to, we need to, as the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance, we need to work together to expose the U.S. government. Republicans and Democrats seem to be on the same side on this, since so at the global level. And we'll be discussing this more um, in this webinar. Um, I think it's also important that we look at how we can help the general public understand what agroecology means, and that includes farmers as well as consumers, because agroecology is not well known here in the United States. Um, but now, what agroecology does though, with that political analysis, allows us to make connections, makes connections with, for instance, when the rainforest is burning in Brazil, a lot of the reason that's burning is to grow more corn and soybeans. And when I look out my window and see the genetically modified corn and soybeans that my neighbors grow, there is a connection there between the rainforest burning in Brazil and in the grasslands of Argentina being plowed for more, more commodities. There's a relationship there. And, and that relationship is um, trade, supply and demand, um, and, and um, expansion of a um, connection with the current pandemic as well. Uh, when we destroy, destroy the forests, people off them for monoculture, destroy biodiversity, that is one of the things that does create more um, virulent viruses and other kinds of pathogens, and there is a connection. We need we can use that. Um, I, think, I think it's just um, it's important to show uh, the agri the, the industrial agriculture system extracts wealth from our communities, exploits nature and labor from foreign unlimited growth defined by capitalism. I think you, can, oh, you have one more minute to sum up the, your Thank you very much. Um, one final point then is to, I think it needs, we need to be cautious that um, agroecology and food sovereignty as well is not co-opted. I see a lot of information where I am about regenerative agriculture and soil health and sequestering carbon in soil. And these are all very well and good, but they're, they're being used by agribusiness to push their own agenda uh, for instance, in, in regenerative agriculture, they talk about no-till. Uh, in Rome, I saw a side event in which um, no-till was promoted for soil health, but also said that we, it has to include biotechnology. And that's what the industry loves to hear. Um, also, we um, done individual farmers to make changes rather than systemic change. It's a lot uh, like in um, ask in consumers to vote with their dollar um, it's all well and good but we have to have systemic change rather than individual choices um, and those are the kinds of things I think that we can talk about as uh, as we talk about agroecology and food sovereignty thank you very much Patty um, so I think uh, we can move on to the next speaker, who is Jim Goodman. Oh, Jim, let me uh, let me unmute you real quick. Got me. Oh, there you are. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you uh, for participating, everyone, and uh, I'm honored to be here. 
in a lot of international efforts uh, through Via Campesina and Family Farm Coalition. Um, the time I spent in Rome last fall at Grisha's was my first involvement in UN space. And it's um, a very different situation. Uh, the, 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 the first thing I remember was seeing the FAO building, which was built when Mussolini was running the show. So it looks like a giant concrete uh, Inside, they've made it a little bit better. Uh, you can put a uh, UN space with all the flags and uh, the, the picture that, that you see here is from the back of the room in the opening ceremony. Uh, on the right hand of your screen is the back of one of the IPC members from Mali, uh, a woman farmer who uh, between herself and, and me, we shared the opening statement of the International Planning Committee. Um, I think the FAO, it's interesting that, that they many years ago made spaces for uh, NGOs and small farming groups, um, peasant farmers, fishermen, indigenous peoples, um, because they saw the need for them to engage with policymakers. And while that's good, um, it's not really going to make much difference unless policymakers listen. Um, obviously, the space is in many instances in the UN, I'm sure, is dominated by industrial agriculture and the northern governments who seem to in, very intent on going ahead with their agenda. Um, Patty mentioned uh, the hostility that the U.S. representative had towards agroecology. Um, I guess I would say that's pretty understandable, uh, but at least they're talking about agroecology, at least they're mentioning it, even if it is in a negative sense. Um, our, our agenda is out there now, and we need to, to press forward with it. Um, so the IPC, the International Planning Committee, um, was basically kind of got started in 1996, formalized by the FAO in 2003, and actually came into force uh, in 2004. Um, four areas that the IPC concentrates on, the right to food, agroecology, land access and control of natural resources, egg trade, and food sovereignty. Uh, the FAO in implementing uh, the IPC and allowing them a space and that they had to be allowed to self-organize. The International Planning Committee uh, tries to maintain a broad outreach to all regions of the world. Uh, they want to uh, facilitate their participation in policy discussion, and they also participate in FAO and civil society conferences, uh, technical committees, and so on around the world. Um, specifically, I was in Rome for the ITPGRFA, which is the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. Uh, I was there for about nine days, and again, mentioning that building, in those nine days, I got lost every time I tried to find a, a uh, meeting. So maybe that was uh, pretty typical of the way Mussolini designed things. Um, when we met last fall, climate change was one of the main concerns, as it has been for many years. Uh, but now um, the International Planning Committee is trying to adjust some of the things that we don't know how they're going to impact the world, but we know they will happen. Uh, food shortages, access to water, electricity access, uh, many people are not able to pay their rent. There's markets closed. Uh, in many parts of the world, workers can't travel to, to their work because of, of uh, COVID concerns. And in many areas, fishing may be prohibited because, again, people can't, are, are not supposed to leave their homes. Uh, to specifically get to the Plant Genetic Resources Treaty, uh, first of all, I'd say it's a very complex treaty. Uh, the, the slide you're seeing now are, are kind of the basic outline of it. I can fill that in a little bit more. Um, basically, it's concerned with seed exchanges and seed banks. Uh, everyone is probably familiar with the big world seed bank in Svalbard, but there are also many regional seed banks. Many countries have their own seed banks. And in much of the developing world, uh, many communities have their own seed banks that they share seeds and plant material amongst their farmers. These seed banks uh, are both on and off site the on-site ones being the bigger ones, generally the national, international seed banks, and, and the uh, on-site 
seeds of, of course, are what farmers share amongst themselves and their communities. The uh, treaty itself, and I'm just going to talk about a couple parts of it. One is Article 9, which is on farmers' rights, uh, discussing the, the multilateral sharing system. Uh, basically, it's supposed to protect the traditional knowledge of plant genetic resources, um, provide right for farmers to participate equitably in benefit sharing, um, in decision making and conservation and sustainable use of plant genetic resources. Article 6 of the treaty talks specifically about what sustainable means. And we know that here in the United States and probably most countries of the North, sustainable has kind of been co opted from what we traditionally understood it to mean. But Article 6 defines it as preserving diverse farming systems and use of plant varieties, uh, research to promote diversity, um, promote appropriate plant breeding with participation of farmers, especially in developing countries, because we know that's where most of the untouched uh, genetic resources are, at least the ones that haven't been polluted by genetic engineering. The article also states that the right, it cannot limit the right of farmers to save, use, sell, exchange their own seeds or cuttings. Um, and in kind of a turnabout of how sustainability is defined, uh, one of the side events I went to was uh, held by the United States and Canada on farmers' rights. And basically their definition of farmers' rights was the right of farmers to use improved or GMO seeds. Uh, if you want to put up the next slide, Matt. So this slide basically outlines some of the problems with the benefit sharing. And benefit sharing basically is uh, that farmers who have put their seeds in these seed banks allow them to be used by researchers, governments uh, to improve them, but they're supposed to be paid for the right to do that. Uh, and the majority of countries that are involved in the treaty do not respect farmers' rights. Uh, they were supposed to make these payments mandatory and provide legislation that would protect the farmer's right uh, to, to save and use their seeds and be compensated for letting other people use them to improve varieties. Uh, unfortunately, this hasn't happened. So far, the only country that's made any meaningful payment is Sweden, uh, some from other, the other European countries, certainly not from the United States. Next slide, please. So the originally, uh, years ago when this was all started, seeds and plant material were the material that were shared. Now, uh, with digital sequence information, um, researchers basically have mapped the genome of many seeds and plants. A lot of that information is available online, uh, no restrictions. Uh, the theory is that the northern countries say, now we don't really need your seeds. All well, we need is a genetic map of them and we can do what we want. Um, and certainly they don't want to pay for any, any information gained through genetic sequencing. The um, idea is that you can take a particular gene, genome, a, a link out of, of a genetic sequence and patent that. If they have that patented, potentially they can control that seed and uh, deny farmers the right to use their own seeds. Um, Civil society groups, uh, the, including IPC, the African nations, the Middle Eastern nations, and a few of the EU countries push the United States and Canada, Australia, who are the main three countries that are uh, opposed to having any benefit sharing result from genetic sequencing information. At one point in the meetings, there was almost uh, the threat of a riot, and the African nations and the Middle Eastern nations threatened to walk out of the meetings unless. DSI was discussed. Uh, the IPC in our opening statement indicated that uh, digital sequence information should be the first thing discussed before the meeting started because we felt that the integrity of the revenue uh, the government didn't take the argument up until midway through the week. Um, and you must remember that the chair of the governing body is a US State Department employee. Uh, she did set up a contact group to discuss uh, digital sequence information, and as the chair of that committee, she appointed the head of the U.S. delegation. Um, only two parties per region were part of that committee. Uh, inherently unfair because Africa has 50 countries, but they only had two, two members in the committee, 
North America has two countries. They also had two members on the committee. As the conference ended, uh, there's no clear path forward. Digital sequence information was not decided as to how that would, how, uh, if it would be paid for, if it would be part of, of the multilateral system. Via Campesina recommended that farmers should no longer share their seeds until farmers' rights and benefit sharing were implemented, including digital sequencing information. Uh, the United States and the industries, the seed industries that they uh, protect, um, basically have two more years now to gather more digital sequence information, material. Uh, one of the, I think it was a delegate from the European Union said it appears that the treaty will freeze along with everything else in the slide. Um, there is an expert advisor that is implemented to protect farmers' rights. Um, the participating countries are allowed to pick their own representatives who they generally have chosen industry experts. I heard someone make a comment uh, because the civil society groups were lobbying to have two specific farmer organizations as part of that committee. And I heard someone comment that farmers are not experts. Um, the U.S. vehemently declined, uh, saying that countries should be allowed to pick their own representatives. If they wanted to pick farmers, they could do that. Um, I think that um, the only countries that have appointed farmers are from Africa. Um, I was the only farmer, I believe, in the whole conference from the United States or Canada. Uh, at the end of the meeting, I told a lawyer from the U.S. delegation that I would volunteer to be a representative on that expert committee if they uh, thought that might be a good idea, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, and the last thing I just want to brush on uh, is CRISPR. Uh, I went to a side event uh, hosted by the United States on CRISPR, and uh, they had three panelists discussing it, and um, I felt like I was part of a brave new world because this they tried to make this sound like it was uh, uh, the new savior for feeding the world. Um, after the, uh, or when the questioning uh, section of the side event started, I asked a question about the CRISPR technology that failed on trying to create, create um, uh, genetically pulled animals. And I told them that uh, in about 10 years time, I had uh, in my herd of cattle, developed about 50% pole gene. Um, and the initial experiment that they were doing using CRISPR turned out not to work so well. It was uh, foreign genetic material in the animals and it had to be scrapped. An Indian farmer that was there uh, took um, objected to the uh, way they were referring to mostly farmers in the developing world as those people being unwilling to accept advanced technology um, a woman objected to their gloss over of the GM crop failures and uh, said if, if GM crops, uh, the initial group of GM crops didn't work, why should we expect that CRISPR would too? And closed the meeting and went to their uh, fancy reception afterwards. Um, yeah, you can put the last slide up. And this was just a picture of. Uh, the uh, the group of us, the International Planning Committee, at least part of us that were there. Um, we took this picture when everyone else was out of the room because I doubt they would have let us take the stage like that. But I think I'll close with that and uh, be happy to answer any questions later. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, so let's go to our final speaker, to uh, um, to Pat. Thanks, Pat, and and thanks for giving me an opportunity to participate in the panel with with uh, uh, Patty and with Jim. Um, so you've heard a description now of of the uh, what's happening at the Committee on Food Security and the struggles there, and also from Jim the description of, of what's happening with the Seed Treaty and the battles there, especially around. Uh, digital sequencing information uh, on what's happening in, uh, in 
the, the multilateral system related to, to the Rome-based agencies, the food agencies in the United Nations. Um, as Patty said, we're, we're coming up to a, a sign of the kind of co-option that happens that, that's uh, in the climate change conference. Those of us involved in the climate justice network were saying, uh, uh, we don't want climate change, we want system change. And the World Economic Forum picked up that and decided to say that what they want in the food system is they want a, they don't want uh, agroecology. What they want is, is a World Food System Summit and change the system to their image and liking. So the, we were faced with uh, really, in real terms, the, the world's second ever big food summit, which will take place in, in the end of 2021, uh, which has been proposed by the World Economic Forum, agribusiness, big businesses, and, and, and uh, rich philanthropic capitalists, and uh, which has been then brought from the World Economic Forum to the United Nations, and the UN has been pressured to accept the idea that there should be that summit, so it will be held next year. The final locale for it still seems to be a bit up for debate, whether it's going to be New York or Rome, it'll probably be New York, but it's not finalized yet. And, and the whole effort to try to create a new system of governance for food and agriculture is coming from really agribusiness and the World Economic Forum. Uh, that's where the pressure is. That's what they're trying to achieve. And they've been caught off guard, of course, as we all have, in a sense, by COVID-19 and the, the pace of negotiation and, and the process they wanted to achieve isn't going to be the way they want it. And that gives us some opportunities to try to, to block the kind of system they want to change and try to move towards a system which is one that's grounded in agroecology and food sovereignty. Um, but it's going to be a real struggle because right, the, they've started it off and they've, they've put together the pieces of organization around the creation of that intergovernmental and corporate summit that uh, really suit their interests. Um, the, uh, and they're doing several things at the same time that they've been caught by. Um, the, the summit is the big thing, that's the big push, but they were also trying to reform and restructure uh, something called the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research. That's the Green Revolution guys. Those are the, the 15 institutions around the world um, funded by bilateral aid agencies and by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Syngenta Foundation, the World Bank, and so on, that, that has the majority of the funds available for international agricultural research. And that, that set of institutions that have been around since 1972 um, have uh, uh, been in financial difficulty for some time. They have a budget every year of about $850 million. And the Gates and Syngenta Foundations have come to them and said, we think we can raise your budget to $2 billion per year from $850 million um, if you sort of follow our plan, which is to... to make these 15 separate legal entities, these research institutes, and put them, make them one, and to create a new relationship between these public sector, so-called public sector institutions, uh, to link them differently with the private sector. So we'll see what has always been a rather uncomfortably close relationship between the, the big seed and pesticide companies and fertilizer companies with public research internationally, seeing that almost formalized now into a whole different structure of, of, uh, that really concentrates the power and, and gives the whip hand uh, for future agricultural research to uh, the multinational corporations. The proposal had been before COVID-19 was to actually get that merger of those 15 centers with the industry done by about now, by, by this summer. Um, that can't happen now because for lots of reasons, but one of them being COVID-19. And so the decisions about how that will be done are now going to be pushed into the negotiations around the food summit coming up next year. They won't be able to avoid that being debated there when they want to avoid governments even really interfering with their processes. There's also been a proposal to create what's called an International Digital Council for Food and Agriculture. That was a, and, and that's the digital council in the sense of how Jim was describing it, the digital sequence information around genetics, around CRISPR-Cas9, uh, gene drives, gene editing technologies, but it's wider than that. That's really half the story when you talk about digital information. The other half of the story is what's happening in terms of, of, of uh, surveillance technologies, sensors, um, 
uh, data in the data in the clouds, ability for for John Deere tractors to hoover up information from fields, uh, park it in, the information in a cloud, download it to Cargill or download it to to Nestle, and um, and control all of the information in the world, all of the production, uh, market, uh, transportation, processing information in agriculture uh, digitally. So that proposal for a digital council and how that's going to be structured is now also uh, bleeding into the organization of the summit. It wasn't meant to be that way again. They'd hoped to deal with that as a separate activity. And I'm summarizing a lot of detail here, but basically now um, the plan is to create that sort of um, uh, 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 hegemony of, of, of digital information. Uh, we'll have to go now to, to, the, to do the food summit next year. Uh, that's good news for us, I think, because then the battle over who controls digital information, the battle over uh, future agriculture, international agricultural research, as well as the restructuring of FAO, the World Food Program, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, all of that will come up at the same time next year. And, and that's helpful. Uh, it's also true that, that there are plans to, uh, that should, should have been held already as a series of regional conferences uh, that FAO holds normally every two years. They would have been normally held at the beginning of this year uh, around the world and, and each region of the world except North America because we just have two countries in North America and they don't want to talk to us there, uh, but in the other parts of the world. And um, that had to be canceled. Now those regional conferences are going to come up at the earliest, at the very end of this year, and more likely at the beginning of 2021, which means that as opposed to being ignored, suddenly now we are going to have in each region of the world, all of the governments in that region coming together where civil society also has an increasingly strong role to play in those meetings to talk about, well, what else, except for the summit that's coming up and what's happening with the digital information and what's happening with the control of international agricultural research. So in a way, it's helpful to us, I think, that, that um, uh, efforts to try to restructure all of, of what Jim and, and Patty were talking about, and much more than that, now is being telescoped into this battle over the summit at the end of next year. And, and we actually do have in a regional process as well as in a global process to the Committee on Food Security, an opportunity to really fight out the issues. And industry doesn't didn't want that. They just wanted to have their summit uh, orchestrated through New York with the Secretary General of the United Nations and get done what they wanted to get done. That won't happen. And and it's very important, I think, for the IPC for food sovereignty and for the CSM, the Civil Society Mechanism in Rome, uh, around the CFS, and all of us working regionally and nationally to to understand what that corporate strategy is and to try to, and to challenge it. And I think we have a good chance of succeeding. The, um, uh, I've said all of that without saying much about agroecology, but uh, I would say that, that, that uh, one of the strategies of the World Economic Forum and of, of agribusiness in general is to welcome agroecology. It's to say, lovely. Uh, everyone's welcome. We have a big tent here. We want everybody in the tent and agroecology can cuddle up right beside genetically modified crops and gen genetically modified livestock and gene drives, CRISPR-Cas9 stuff. They can all be in the same tent and, and we'll just absorb it with everything else. Of course, it doesn't work that way. You can't do that, but they're saying they can. So you don't get from uh, industry, uh, the, the big companies, or from uh, from uh, the World Economic Forum, you don't get an attack on agroecology like as you do get from uh, from uh, Kim Tom in, in as uh, the U.S. representative in, in Rome. What you get is, in fact, uh, a welcoming with the idea that, well, yes, we'll take it on, then we'll just destroy it uh, and, and and pay lip service to it, but we'll really run with what's called climate smart agriculture. And that's what they're pursuing is that climate smart agriculture strategy, uh, all data driven uh, and controlled by multinational companies. And for them, in that sense, COVID uh, does play into their, their uh, strategies because what we're recognizing that the industrial food chain is proving itself to be a failure in front of COVID-19. Um, Governments don't quite get it that way yet. Maybe they will, but they haven't so far. They're mostly catching on that they're in trouble. And industry is saying, the only way you're going to get out of this trouble is by letting us get bigger 
and more powerful and adopting our technologies that'll get us through future pandemics, because there'll be other ones, and uh, future crises and climate change, which is part of the pandemic. And, uh, and so give us, give us the tools we need, the, the freedom we need to make the kind of agribusiness that we want to have. And that's being listened to by a lot of governments, obviously the US government, uh, the Canadian government, very much so as well. Uh, Australia, as, as, as Jim mentioned, uh, uh, the UK as well. Um, many other countries are actually buying into that, uh, Argentina, uh, Brazil as well. So that's the, the, uh, the kind of trend. Uh, so I don't know how much time I've got left here, but, but the, what this comes down to then is we've got a very, very big battle, not just for agroecology, but for anything related to kind of uh, flexibility for food sovereignty that'll be play out with a major uh, confrontation uh, in September of 2021. And uh, the route getting to there is through the Committee on Food Security, uh, through the negotiations around that, through the regional conferences that FAO will organize, which will have to become sort of preparatory meetings for the summit around the world. And, um, and the battles we fight, of course, on our home ground in each of our countries. So that, that's the, the, the broader picture I'd like to present. Uh, I don't think we've been, I've been, uh, um, um, Shiny said that I've been doing this work for 40 years. That was 10 years ago. I've been doing it for 50 years now. And, and I don't think we've ever been at a moment in history, uh, modern history of the United Nations at least, where we've been more of an, at a crisis point, at a crunch point than we are now uh, with, with the future of uh, food sovereignty in, in the balance. And we have a chance of succeeding. We have a chance of actually making progress here. It's not all playing into the hands of, of, a, of bad governments and bad corporations. Uh, uh, there is room to maneuver that we can take advantage of, but we have, to, we have to see the whole picture, understand the various pieces that are moving together uh, in order to confront it. It's, it's not just the seed treaty with food security. It's this, uh, system change as agribusiness is willing to describe it. So thank you, uh, Patty and Jim and Pat, of course, uh, for sharing the, the challenges from different sides to agroecology, uh, farmers' rights treaty negotiation space, CFS, and also World Economic Forum and its allies. So, um, so one, the good thing is over here is that most of us uh, who are registered for this webinar are either members of the USFSA or allies or friends. And so probably you are already thinking of these issues. Uh, the struggles between, on the one hand, this technology focused food production and corporate concentrated food supply on the one hand, and on the other hand, food justice and environmental justice focused approaches to promote food sovereignty and progressive realization of right to food. So that's a struggle. And some of these are likely already playing out in your own backyards. So those of us, we, we, when we were involved in uh, thinking about this uh, webinar, we thought that it would be great to hear the experiences of these struggles and uh, if, from you all and share your thoughts on how these UN pr processes are relevant already or how can that uh, be more, made more relevant or more effective for those of us here in the US and also in other countries. And this also brings us to another question. Um, how can US organizations like USFSA and uh, in the US who prioritize food struggles, uh, they can engage more strongly with our allies worldwide to hold US accountable so yeah, 